Hi there. Welcome back. Thank you for listening to this special extra podcast in the Reader Take Note series. A few years ago, I published a reading plan on YouVersion called Buckling the Belt of Truth. And in this podcast, I'm reissuing the first episode of that reading plan. Here I am at 72. I'm beginning not to be so surprised at my own age. Being so very elderly, perhaps it's time to share some grandfatherly advice. Maybe I have some of you fooled. Some of you may think that an elder missionary like me has it all together and that I don't ever sin. You might think that I have conquered all weaknesses and no longer have episodes of sinful thoughts. You would be wrong. And I suspect that I don't fool everyone. People who really know me have seen my weaknesses. However, if I'm working with the right information, a lot of you have struggles with sin the same way I do. So let me start by calling our attention again to these frequently quoted verses from 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 3 and 4. By His divine power, God has given us everything we need for living a godly life. We have received all of this by coming to know Him— the one who called us to himself by means of his marvelous glory and excellence. And because of his glory and excellence, he has given us great and precious promises. These are the promises that enable you to share his divine nature and escape the world's corruption caused by human desires. Wow, those are great verses, but they leave me asking, even crying out, which promises? I don't think I've escaped the world's corruption yet. Have I been overlooking a key promise somewhere? Peter follows verses 3 and 4 by urging his readers to take steps for spiritual maturity found in verses 5 through 8. While Peter gives great advice in those verses, which I hope you will study, I still keep coming back to verses 3 and 4 and asking, how do I put golden promises found somewhere else in the Bible into effect so that through them I can share in God's divine nature and truly escape from bondage to sinful desires? What are the practical steps to do that? Where can I find the promises that unlock moral excellence and self-control? Just like any college curriculum, before you start advanced courses, you need to take the prerequisites. So also, for you to get the most from this study, here are the prerequisites. This study is for true believers in Christ who are mature enough in following Jesus to have experienced the frustration I just explained. The five to seven studies I'm hoping to start with this session won't be much help to you if you're living in gross disobedience to basic commands in God's Word. Using an extreme example— If you make your living by stealing packages, you need to get an honest job before taking this course. This course is for those seeking spiritual maturity. The first step in becoming a mature follower of Jesus is for you to repent of all openly disobedient lifestyles. Another foundational step toward maturity is being a member of a local Bible-believing church, being baptized, and taking part in the Lord's Supper with your fellow believers. 
I can imagine some readers complaining about my saying this. I urge you to understand that membership in an organized fellowship of believers is a baked-in part of how God designed humans to live. The picture of community life starts in Genesis and goes through the whole Bible. You will not be successful in your quest for spiritual maturity if you're attempting to live as a lone ranger Christian. Other readers will say, I don't want to be a lone ranger, but there isn't a Bible-believing church near me. I recognize that finding a church that is faithfully teaching the Bible will become increasingly difficult at this time, especially in some countries but also anywhere in the increasingly post-Christian world. Look for a home fellowship that you can join. Finally, an important foundational prerequisite step is to cultivate a scheduled Bible reading habit. And if you have found this podcast by listening to the Daily Bible Reading Podcast series, then you're on the way to having a good Bible reading habit. So, if you fit that profile with those prerequisites, please continue to listen or read. My first step to finding the golden promises Peter mentioned and escaping moral corruption is to put on the belt of truth. This is one of seven parts to the Christian's armor found in Ephesians 6, But let me suggest a further clarification. Buckle the belt of truth by believing what God says about you in the Bible. If you're a Christian, you believe a lot of true things already about Christ and the Bible. You believe Christ came to earth to save us. You believe that the Bible is God's message to us. But do you reject believing other things the Bible says about you. If you do, it's like putting on the belt, putting it through your belt loops, but not buckling it. So let's learn how to buckle the belt of truth. In this lesson, I want to sensitize you to realize when you don't actually believe it, when the Bible says incredibly awesome things about you, as a believer in Christ. Having this realization is often the hardest part. After that, ask God to renew your mind to fully accept the new truth. Let's make one more thing clear about believing. Believing isn't something that just sort of happens. Believing is an act of your will. You decide if you believe something or believe somebody or not. This is why in Scripture we read that God commanded people to believe and do what He told them, and He punished them for a stubborn refusal to believe His commands. Just look at the people of Israel who followed Moses all the way from Egypt and through the wilderness for years. They got all the way to the border of the promised land, knowing all the time what they would have to do. And when the Lord said, Now it's time to enter and conquer the land, they said, Surely you couldn't mean us. Let's go back to where we started. Peter said, God has given us great and precious promises. These are the promises that enable you to share His divine nature and escape the world's corruption caused by human desires. Here's the basic principle I hope you will learn. When you encounter great and precious promises in your Bible reading, telling you about wonderful things God has done for you or given to you, Ask God to make those things real to you. Ask Him to open your mind to receive that truth about you and help you live in the light of that truth. 
You'll need to pray asking God for such help, because for your whole life Satan and his friends have been feeding lies to you. Now let's turn to Ephesians chapter 1. You might want to follow along in the episode notes if you can do that at this point so that you can see the words I have highlighted. Ephesians 1, starting at the first verse. This letter is from Paul, chosen by the will of God to be an apostle of Christ Jesus. I am writing to God's holy people, in Ephesus, who are faithful followers of Christ Jesus. May God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ give you grace and peace. So, this letter, written to normal believers in Ephesus, is therefore written to us too. For now, let's skip the idea that Paul called them holy people, because Paul comes back to that idea more than once below. Verse 3. All praise to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly realms, because we are united to Christ. Even before he made the world, God loved us and chose us in Christ to be holy and without fault in His eyes. God decided in advance to adopt us into His own family by bringing us to Himself through Jesus Christ. This is what He wanted to do, and it gave Him great pleasure. So we praise God for the glorious grace He has poured out on us who belong to His dear Son. He is so rich in kindness and grace, and He purchased our freedom with the blood of His Son and forgave our sins. He has showered His kindness on us along with all wisdom and understanding. This paragraph turns our normal understanding upside down. I think that most people think of God as the angry judge that will destroy us. But these verses have God as the actor doing all these wonderful things, which are too many for me to comment on right now. Let me highlight just two of them. God loves us and called us in advance. Change what you think about God and yourself. Tell this truth to yourself. God loves even me. God called me long ago. Before I was born, amazingly, it says, before he made the world. Let's claim another truth here. As a believer in Christ, you are united with Christ. A literal translation will say, in Christ. Jesus spoke of this unity when he said, I am the vine and you are the branches. Remain in me, that means joined to me, like branches to a vine. Remain in me or joined to me and I will remain in you. For a branch cannot produce fruit if it is severed from the vine, and you cannot be fruitful unless you remain joined to me. The idea of being joined to Christ or in Christ is spoken of in many places in Paul's writing, and it becomes one of the themes of this letter. But dear friend, It's time for you to start believing this idea about yourself. This is a key concept in believing that you are accepted as holy in God's sight. If you see yourself as separate from Christ, sadly, you will act like you are not connected to Christ. Now, with this connection, we also have the reason that we're holy. It's not that we're saints, but we have been made holy by Christ. 
we have received his holiness. And now another thing to notice in that passage. Out of the incredible richness of this paragraph, I want to pull out one more gem. God has adopted you and me into his family. In the Greek, Paul used a legal term here, which means that you have been given sonship or legally adopted as a son. In Roman law, the adoption of a son could not be undone. It was permanent. Ladies, in this spiritual reality, don't let the male gender of this term rob you from considering yourself permanently adopted. Dear friend, it's time to revise how you think of yourself. You're not a nobody. You're not unloved. You are a permanent member adopted into the most powerful royal family. Let's skip down now to the middle of verse 13. When you believed in Christ, he identified you as his own by giving you the Holy Spirit, whom he promised long ago. The Spirit is God's guarantee that he will give us the inheritance he promised and that he has purchased us to be his own people. He did this so we would praise and glorify him. Think about this. God has given you a guarantee that he's going to give you a wonderful inheritance. Stop saying, well, as long as I get to heaven, I don't need an inheritance. God wants us to think about that inheritance. It's healthy for us to think longingly for our inheritance in heaven. Our guarantee is not some flimsy card that we will misplace. Our guarantee is the presence of the Holy Spirit in our hearts. Our text says, When you believed in Christ, He, that is God, identified you as His own by giving you the Holy Spirit. It's crucial that you have a sense of belonging to God given by the Holy Spirit. Think of how personal and intimate is this bond we now have with God. I think you'll find that this so intimate connection is something you want to keep. This is one of our main motivations in seeking to live a holy life in God's sight. And Romans 8 verse 9 says, And remember that those who do not have the Spirit of Christ living in them do not belong to Him at all. And it's no wonder that in the passage in John 15 where Jesus talks about the vine and the branches, he mentions prayer. If you remain in me and my words remain in you, he says in verse 7, you may ask for anything you want and it will be granted. If we aren't praying, then we aren't believing the truths that I have just listed for you. Here are the power points. God is for us and loves us. God is the actor for most of the chapter, chapter 1. This love from God the Father is counterintuitive for us. We do not believe it unless we realize it and pray to God asking for him to make it real to us. God went to great lengths to put his plan into action. This gives us great confidence that we really have been called by him. We are united to Christ so much that he considers us actually part of his body. We are one with him, joined to him, 
and we have a powerful guarantee, the Holy Spirit, who's not an external thing, but an inward witness that we are joined with Christ. We are God's holy people, not because we have the power to be holy, but God has made us holy by our unity with Christ. This is our identity. Take this identity. Believe this identity. I have been made holy by Christ. Preserve this identity by taking care of the unity you have with the Holy Spirit. Paul wants us to understand all these things so that we understand that God will use his power to help us. So let's pray right now concerning these things. Dear Heavenly Father, we confess that so often we don't think that you love us. We don't think that you've called us in advance before we were born. We think of you as an angry judge. But now that we have believed in Christ, that's not how we should picture you. Help us to believe that you love us, that you're for us, that you want us, that you have adopted us. Lord, help us to believe that we have become united, part of the vine that is Jesus. We are one with him. He is one with us. He remains with us, and we will remain with him, joined to him. Lord, help us to believe the wonderful, permanent position given to us by your adopting us as your sons. We are your children, and you love us, and you want to answer our prayers. And not only that, dear Lord, you've given us the Holy Spirit. You promised the Holy Spirit would come, and he is here. And he is our guarantee that all these wonderful things are true. You're not lying to us. It's Satan who lies to us. Lord, these are just a few of the wonderful promises that you've given to us. Help us to take these promises. Help us to take these truths about ourselves and get them into our hearts. And we pray this for the glory of Christ. Now, there's something else I'd like to say. I've heard it said quite a lot that in the Bible we have things that are already and not yet. Yes, we already have been adopted as sons, but people will say, but we don't see it yet. We don't, we just, that's just something for the future. No, I'm sorry. The truths that I've told about are not already, but not yet. They are already and already here to be claimed, to be used. We can't see them, their spiritual realities, but they are already true about us. We don't have to wait for heaven to realize that we are one with Christ, that we are adopted as his sons, that we are in a powerful position because Jesus and the Father listen to us. We can ask for help. So now I would like to give you your homework. I would ask you to look at these things more carefully on your own. You'll notice that I didn't finish reading Ephesians chapter 1. So I ask you to read 2 Peter chapter 1 verses 3 through 8. Ephesians 6, 10 through 18. All of Ephesians 1 and Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 through 10. And if you want more practice, 
Try the book of Colossians. I'm so glad you've listened to this episode. And Gail and I send our greetings to you. May the Lord bless you real good.